everyone is in. Still, all right, so hi everyone. Hi once more, and we're very happy to welcome you to this very special session, uh, opening week two of Indelible's second annual festival of literature. So again, a big thanks to all of you for joining us today from so many different places and time zones around the world. And we're delighted to have you join this fantastic event that is planned for today. Uh, we hope you find it another indelible experience, and I'm pretty sure that you will with Ruth and Abhe with us today. So um, we'd like to give a special thanks to the festival sponsors this year, the American University in Dubai, the Universita Gabriele D'Annunzio in Italy, uh, EBSCO host, uh, Montessori Academy in Australia, Pedagogy and Beyond, Salmon Poetry, and the International Association for Jungian Studies. Um, everyone, uh, if you don't know me, I am Rula Maria Deeb, the editor of Indelible. And uh, my co-host for today is um, Adam Wyatt. Um, and before we start the session, uh, I'll just, I just want to take a moment for a few reminders. Just uh, please make sure that your mics are muted during the session um, in order to avoid any um, buzz or interfering background noise. Uh, we will be having a Q&A after the talk, so you could either choose to type your questions into the chat box or you could use the raise hand function um, to use the microphone and directly ask uh, one of the poets today the questions or give them the comments that you would like. Um, the title of today's session, as you all know, is um, The Fragile Earth. So uh, many of you here know what ecopoetics is, and I've been asked actually, so what is this ecopoetics? Um, it, it is a relatively new uh, area, and many people wonder what it is. So it's, firstly, it is not, not an extension of romanticism, and um, it does not concentrate on the utopian visions of nature um, or the imaginative quality uh, of people in nature. Um, but what it does is attempt to locate us or to help us locate ourselves as humans in the world, in our environment, the natural environment. So ecopoetics has the intention of focusing on ecology and uh, going back to the word ecology, um, which is derived from the word, from the Greek word ekos, home, and logos, reason, uh, we could see that it investigates how the human is situated within its home and um, how this home is perceived, how it is built through poetry, through imagination. And most importantly, it navigates how the borders between us as nature and non-human nature, um, whether there are borders that exist between us or not. Um, how images, places, and spaces, memories, how they all assist our desire to explore this relationship of the self with the world. So ecopoetry, therefore, uses a more critical lens in viewing humanity's relationship with the planet, instead of merely focusing on unfolding scenes of nature through verse. Uh, as a matter of fact, it does not give us this observer status all the time, because an observer status could make us disconnect from nature. But on the contrary, it shows how we are nature and it highlights the complexities of our relationships or interrelationships within the environment and our responsibilities toward it. And um, so we greatly look forward to this. And finally, without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Adam, to welcome tonight's featured guests. Thanks very much, Rula Maria. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, it's a great honour to introduce our two extraordinary poets today, or this evening, Ruth Padell and Abbe Kay, both award-winning and critically acclaimed. And while being leading poets, they also lead the way as clear and eloquent communicators of poetry, and much more. Um, I'll never forget the deep impact Ruth Padell's fantastic book, 52 Ways of Looking at a Poem, had on me many years ago as a young poet, and which went on to inspire my own book of close readings, The Hidden World of Poetry. Passionately engaged with environmental concerns for over a decade, both poets will read poems concerned with wildlife, climate, and the vulnerable state of nature today, as our planet faces triple threats of climate change, biodiversity loss, and environmental pollution. And I believe Ruth Fidel's going to read some new poems as well, which is great. Both poets um, have extensive biographies with many great titles to their names. Um, so that we have more time listening to the poetry and, and reading and talking, 
I'll keep their intro short. <clears throat> but just to begin with Ruth, uh, who's, who's reading first. So Ruth Padell is an award-winning British poet, essayist and novelist. She is a great granddaughter of Charles Darwin. Padell is well known for her poetic explorations of migration and of science with close links to Greece, classical music and wildlife conservation, especially in India. She's published 12 poetry collections shortlisted for all major UK prizes. Most recently, Beethoven variations and we're all from somewhere else on migration and two novels, most recently, the superb Daughters of the Labyrinth, which I highly recommend. Her nonfiction includes books on reading poetry, such as 52 Ways of Looking at a Poem, a study of rock music and Greek myth, a memoir focusing on wild tiger conservation and books on Greek tragedy. She is professor of poetry at King's College London and fellow of both the Zoological Society of London and Royal Society of Literature. Awards include first prize in the National Poetry Competition UK, a British Council Darwin Now Award, and a Chumley Prize. So please give a warm, incredible, indelible welcome to Ruth Padell. Well, thank you, Adam. Thank you so much. And, and hello, everybody. And it's extraordinary to be here across, you know, in this sort of triple triple, I mean, I can see people from Ireland, people from Dubai, it's just amazing. So, um, so there is this triple threat, the climate collapse, the environmental degradation and pollution, and the loss of biodiversity. And that's a very abstract way to say animals are dying um, all the time, every hour. And so I, I've been mainly known for, for the, the, my tiger conservation book, and I'm now working on one on elephants. So I, th I thought I'd do one on elephants. This is a wild elephant um, and her calf has died. And it's in the south of India and everything is very dry. Elephant heart. Nothing all day. Then we see her in the soft glow of evening slipping out from trees onto the road. A bereaved mother, gray breasts dangling between her front legs, like a woman's breasts between a woman's arms, carrying the dehydrated body of her calf. She sets it down, brushes the slack skin lightly, gazes at a dead, tote bag with short rubber tube, as if at the last sunrise on earth. I imagine her heart, a pulsing sack of pipes in the baggy symphony of her body. You know what they say, love can draw even someone like her through a keyhole. Now others, look, basalt ghosts, fanning their ears. The frilled edges shiver, ratty and torn, as if the gods of listening had ripped out their jewels. We hardly breathe. We are too close. They are too dangerous. Go after you, kill in a flash. But what they want is water. The mine at their river. The bed is dry stone speckled silver like spit from a wheezy old man. They cross the road swift as a sickle and a garn. She stays on, still mourning, still what? Adoring. This is earth in its chaos of love. This is her heart, all of our hearts, River and forest, enchantment of dark light and tangle laid open. Tarmac lancing their home, and we are part of it. What were we thinking? First, the green silence. Tuck, tuck, tuck from a coppersmith bird. Then motorbike, motorbike, trucks backing up, shouty revving, rattle and fume. She cuddles her burden and vanishes. 
like a song you were trying to remember into the last life-giving stand of Rosewood and Arjuna. And for us, a cold lost feeling, that whetstone of a moon. So it's the effect on wildlife of what we do and what we make that is so appalling to see over and over again in the, in the forests and in our own in the cities. But one of the things that's been really exercising me for the last few years is, is the psychology of denialism, as why do people want to deny what is happening? Um, I mean, I have thrown people who were cooking me a perfectly good meal out of my kitchen, out of my house, for, for um, you know, instead of saying that climate change was a was was a hoax and it wasn't it wasn't really happening, and you know you see it happening everywhere. So, um, so a lot of these poems now, and I are they're about two things. They're about sort of um, water, which is so much part of. Of, of the catastrophe. Water is that's get, it's in the wrong place. Sometimes it isn't there when it should be, and sometimes it's much too much there when it, it shouldn't be. Um, and that's because of what we are doing. <clears throat> um, but it's also the sense of what's beneath and the, the psychology, the underworld and the underground of water, as it were, and our, psy our psyche. So a lot of these poems are, I'm trying to work something else out about that. So these are new poems and new experiments. First, the first one is called Green Leaves, Green Waves. People who are only somewhat concerned about the climate are killing us, says the director of Don't Look Up. What I remember from playing and singing in a children's opera in a suburban London church is my two youngest brothers going into the ark in blue tit masks. And then the dance of the raven to toots on the clarinet saying, no land. Then the dove, some pale child with a branch of green leaves dancing to a flute. But most of all, I remember Mrs. Noah, who did not want to go, dragged up the gangplank with a cup in her hand, shouting, I will stay with my gossips, as the paper boat wafted past the altar. How we played and sang louder in the storm. How the tissuey waves billowed green depth around her friends. When I was working on migration, the, the, that book that Adam mentioned, someone pointed out to me that probably the first the first um, picture of refugees, certainly of climate refugees, would be Michelangelo's picture of the Noah's Ark in the Sistine Chapel of the, of the flood sailing away and all the people left trying desperately to, to um, climb trees and so on. So this little poem is called, No, We Don't Want to Look. Riffle through dying corals in your bed the things you don't want to know that you really do know, under sorrow, serpents in your tide, witchcraft under the floor, hidden fox foam sluicing from the underworld to the concrete Thames barrier. Well, there's so much about water. And um, this is a question that I keep coming back to. The poem is called, If Water Always Finds Its Own Level, How Can the Earth Be Curved? Let's bring back a figure of innocence, a ballerina who can stand for all of us somewhere in our souls, dancing the swan at the edge of the lake, gazing at where she, he came from, the elephant element where we began and can never return, gazing at water hyacinths choking good reeds, and a cloud of swamp mosquitoes breeding in the veil of health, where everything that disappeared from our life has got stuck in the pinch of the hourglass, 
the winter solstice furled up in frost. When water is in the wrong place, in your eyes, on your knee, on the brain, or else draining and lost, always shifting away to unhallowed ground you can't protect, but calling out to the need to be whole, the possibility of celebration even in tough times. And the eye of Shiva, destructive but also compassionate in white and black stone high in the Himalaya. All the questions of identity, origins and home you have never let yourself ask. So um, I don't know if you know, I don't know if there's anybody here from Australia, but a blue ringed octopus is about the most venomous people, creature on the planet. It, it doesn't, it's, it's not its bite, it's its sting. And this was prompted by a, a girl on who took a who took a selfie with with one, not knowing what the hell it was. But it's also about the danger of what we're doing, how we are handling our image of ourselves in the planet. Selfie with blue ringed octopus. It's about water, but also psychology. How we feel thinking of climate. Bad dreams lit raindrops on window of the late nice bus. A prelude, a fugue, a tarantelle for the girl on a Sydney beach who picked up a tiny blue ringed octopus, most dangerous creature in the sea, for a selfie. It rested in the cup of her hand, one small jelly spider, two legs folded under itself, as if it were on its knees, praying. So um, recently, of course, Australia has had appalling floods, but we've had some too. Um, and yeah, this is, I suppose, about flood. It's, the poem is called Harm's Way. We dreamed a city on flood alert where different bodies and watercourses speak to new understandings of the soul. And the women of Shrewsbury stand in their living room wearing boots and quilted anoraks. Brown water laps the top edges of their Wellingtons. They are all wept out, watching their kettle float out into the street. And the TV is up behind them out of harm's way. You warned of flash floods in the tunnels of London's underground. Humours below the skin, storm surge filling the valleys. And that heart space of innerness where ruffled means threat. As in the single Anglo-Saxon word for tempest and imagination, both at once. The threat of inside appearing outside when tempers break easy as the levee around Lafitte, Louisiana. And a young man lifts an AK-47. We come to the place where you're never in place and nothing is out of harm's way. You have to dive in. I want to be the other side of the door. I want someone to blame. So, um, of course, water has always been a sense of inspiration too. It's the fountain of Pegasus. It's the water is an image for so many things that are good and purifying in our life. The flooded carburetor. We listen to the newscaster on late night TV pronouncing a word which means hurricane, but also warriors out of control. Like poets listening out for that perfect adjective, the wham of the fountain released by the front hoof of Pegasus, the crash of a waterfall in burning rainforest, the structure of splash shimmer, lapping and dissonance, the lub-dub-dub of a world walloping about like a flooded carburetor, the music of what happens 
when you open up a hoard of unclaimed body parts. And of course, in all our minds, as well as the, the environmental crisis, we're thinking of all the destruction and the tragedies that are happening in Ukraine at the same time. Um, but water has always been there as, a, as an image of hope. And I was amazed by it to learn this. Um, and when you think of the way that the Hittites were destroyed, I mean, it is destruction after destruction of, of where we are and what we do. <coughs> we keep doing it. I think I hear again the Hittite for water. Sorry to be so self-referential, we really do need water. Um, I think I hear again the Hittite for water. Lift the floorboards, look for the love you buried and set it free. Music of the deep, the flood that covered Atlantis, rippling in drop by drop to help you find meaning in all this confusion. Singing je crois entendre encore from the pearl fishers. Like, let's imagine, the melody sung by a Hittite priest pouring lustral drops into a basin of copper. So the other priest, as the inscription says, can put the bowl down beside their holy monument to water and pour a libation over his head. In the dark room, when new images are made, they're not that different from us, those Hittites. All the feelings, all the fears, the colliding of water, whatever we do to it, with hope. Thirsty as a vacuum running its mouth along the floor, we still care about the river of life flowing back to its source. And the Hittite for water is, amazingly, wa-a-ta-a. -a. Even the word is close to us close as melt water from the mountains of Iran, where the idea of Eden began. Or the past, ferried here on its bed of ice by the daughters of Radamanthus, which still brings us the goodness of earth, the goodness of water in green nature, which is our nature too. I want it, you want it, we all do the grace-filled encounters, to be known, to be loved, to be seen. Well, there's not that much fresh water in the world left. I saw an extraordinary global map in which all the world's fresh water was just one bubble over a part of the United States, smaller than this state. So I'm going to, this is a poem really about what's underneath and what our resources are and how we're polluting it. And <clears throat> I suppose form, the form of a poem is what gives us hope in trying to make sense of what's happening to us. All the world's fresh water in one bubble over Atlanta, Georgia. Groundwater, rivers, swamp water, ponds. You wait for the augury, sing to the brook. But life flies out and away, blackbird shrieking alarm from a leafless branch. Your hands shake like rags in a gale. Wind whips the lake into bubble froth soap suds and wet wipes blocking the drain. So I'm, I'm going to read for about five more minutes. Um, and I've got a lot here. But um, I, want, I want to have, I think it's really important for us to have hope as well as despair, to lay bare what's wrong, but also find strength in ourselves. Um, so You could see yourself as water blown by wind. 
child, girl, some light figure poised at the jump zone, carrying an empty skin to the well with a thousand names for water bearer, angel in the desert, pure energy pouring to earth, spark of enlightenment descending from heaven, translating darkness to light, symbolized by two bolts of lightning. But what is this drip, drip, drip down walls of an empty room? How quick, you say, there's nothing. Suppose what you depend on is what you're afraid of. How the God-given flow we thought would baptize and purify is vector of cholera, polio, and a thousand industrial toxins that will never degrade or die. But there is also dance, light, and spin drift, new worlds in every eddy of relationship, reflection, refraction, ripple, and play, moonlight on the lake, water dazzle, unzipping the longings of horizon oxygen, calm, and new landscape in a world going up in flames, tipped at the precipice, but also the edge of epiphany, what lies beyond. Like the ivory acrobat, girl or girl boy, diving like liquid through air, arms stretching out to the monster's horns, as a drop dies in the river of its joy. I'll just read two more. Um, okay, this is a slightly more autobiographical one, and it's also sort of it, it ends with a goddess who is always seen by water, beside water. The day my father left me on the pavement in Oxford Street, on the horizon. I see green meadows and clear pools and the promise of something new, like eventually. The day my father left me on the pavement in Oxford Street because I kept him waiting. <coughs> he was fed up. I had to learn to find my own way, come back by myself. Did he even know I had money to get home? The past is always inside us the future over the horizon coming up from under. <coughs> or scampering over the surface of a luminous mirror freckled with weed, where the Nereids hide, the water nymphs, to come out at night to dance and maybe send mad any men waiting for them. Nymphs of the river, nymphs of the sea, Daughters of ocean who at the end will choose to go down to Hades with the bringer of fire. Nymphs of imagination sleeping at the source of the Danube. Nymphs of shimmer and sometimes deception in the free swirl out of the gender frame where you can be anyone, anyone you want, like the shape-shifting Selkie. Again, a male story who lives in the world you picture under the riptide which might do for you altogether, a rogue wave you might never climb out of, in your fear of the other with the sea in her hands, and your fear of what lies beneath, where a woman can swim with her own story, flow with the current, create her own realm, like a song pulled out of the trees by Saraswati, goddess of knowledge, wisdom and art, whom you may see with a sitar and white lotus, or alone with her many arms, representing the many possibilities of imagining, but always, always sitting by water. Clear water. See where it takes you, being left on the pavement, alone. So I'll finish with um, two poems that are much more overtly about the hope of something good coming out of destruction. Listen to the shiver of water on moss. Despairing, you sought out a place of reflection. The broken stick seemed straight, 
the underworld refracted through eyes of a hawk moth, and a vessel, say, a two-handled jug you can pour out in prayer, or an earthenware jar in the bows of a coracle that might take you across the Pacific. Water offered a partnership, saying, you balk me out with silicon and dams. You worship the dike builders, the smelters of bronze, the ready solutions engineer who charges the earth for detailed plans to divert my ancient course. While the last forest pool is seeping undetective through fern to the crossing where the Buddha spent his years as ferryman. But even now, after all this, you can sail safe in me fine if you treat me right. Light shone, unforgivably bright, unforgivably clear. And from the reeds came the song of a single bird, a slow cadence deeper than a voice, any voice you have ever heard, ringing remote and cool, like a little gong above the sound of water, a mountain stream, ice cold and swift running, flowing over your dreams. Each note very round and pure, with a deep undertone, echoed among the boulders in an endless interlacing of green. And finally, two, two trees that have survived horror. Where the root survived. <clears throat> Everyone knows her story. The calorie pear tree at ground zero, mashed between blocks of cement. Half a trunk, all carbon, <clears throat> roots sliced away, and only one living branch. She would have gone to the dump like any stent or cannula marked single use. But a young cleaner upper took her to a nursery, and now look, in spring, white blossom, like the 500 year old camphor tree of Nagasaki. Only the bottom of a tree, really. All branches gone except one, and not a single leaf when it was found, but alive, a holy tree now, a monument. Prayers in tiny kanji characters hang from that branch for everyone who died. Through cracks and slashes in its trunk, you can see its black twilight inside, like maybe in all of us. And perhaps it isn't possible to ask where hope is now in this world, please. But every spring, that tree puts out new leaves. Mm. Thank Thanks so much, Ruth. That was um, amazing. Really um, yeah, really intimate and, and just yeah incredible I love I mean these are poems that really do capture the music of what happens in, in all its terrifying you know and you know and glorious ways well I'm glad because I, it's new for me to read them so you're you're the first audience probably wow oh. <laughs> and Thanks. we are thankful I mean we're thank you so much for giving us the honor of being the first audience to hear them well, I'm looking forward to Ape now <laughs> hey, Abe. Yeah. So, yes, Abe K is is on is our next reader. Um, Abe is the author of ten poetry collections. Um, just some of his amazing titles include Monsoon, The Magic of Madagascar, The Alphabets of Latin America. He's the editor of the Book of Buhari Literature. Um, HarperCollins 2022, and the Bloomsbury Anthology of Great Indian Poems, Capitals, New Brazilian Poems, and the Bloomsbury Book of Great Indian Love Poems. Kay's poems have appeared in over a hundred literary magazines, um, which I won't mention here. His, his Earth Anthem has been translated into over 150 languages. He received Sark Literary Award 2013, and was invited to record his poems at the Library of Congress, Washington, D.C. in 2018. His translations of Kalidasi's uh, Megaduta and Richumara um, from Sanskrit have won KLF Poetry Book of the Year Award 2020 
to 2021. So please, again, give a warm, incredible, indelible welcome to uh, Abe K. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, uh, Rula Maria. And thank you, Ruth. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, a challenge uh, for me to read after Ruth. Uh, you, uh, after your mesmerizing poetry, uh, I don't think I can match, uh, but I'll try to, you know, pick up the thread where you have ended um, of hope. Uh, hope, hope that um, a new, uh, a new sprout, a new leaf, a new, new bud that brings to this world. And uh, uh, I would start by saying that uh, mm, it's not the earth that is fragile, but it's the humanity. I'm sure other species who share this planet with us will survive and will live but I'm not so hopeful about humanity. The dark side of life. We are manifestations of life, the book says. God created us in his own image. But I wonder, life goes on even after we die. Species become extinct and new species evolve. What, we, what if we are just pawns in life's great game? Falling in love, reproducing, raising children with great care and unconditional love till they grow up to repeat the same. What if life just uses us to preserve itself and propagate. It hardly matters this species or that, dinosaurs or humans, is just the same, only forms change. Life evolves as fast as it can, but we humans vainly believe we are something special in the scheme of creation, created in God's own image. To exploit nature, failing to see the truth that we are just pawns in life's great game. The moment there is a change, we will be discarded in the dustbin of extinction. While life will move on, ever evolving into brand new species and man created in God's own image will join the dodos and dinosaurs. Here is the second poem, it's called the planet will be the same. Air will change, water will change, people will change, country will change. My friends say, hearing the news that I have to leave. And I say, dear friends, air will change, water will change, people will change. Country will change, but the planet will be the same. And here's a poem called Neem. Neem is a tree which is uh, in, which grows in plenty in Delhi. And these two poems are about Delhi and Neem. 
under my ubiquitous shade lie scattered cities of Delhi. Delhi and I are one and the same. My yellow green fruits, delicious when ripe, bitter when raw. Only the wise know the difference. And Yamuna, it's a river which flows in Delhi. Bedrawn and sulky, I flow past Delhi like dark silver, caressing the city shores, draining darkness from Delhi's soul. And here's the poem about a national park in Nepal called Bardia. Ruth might have visited this place. A wild boar rushes through thickets of shrubs, chasing a herd of deer. Clouds of smoke rise. Elephants carry tourists back to their cottages across the Babai River. A rhino rests in the middle of the jungle. Birds settle in their nests. The moon slowly sends the sky. The jungle comes down to welcome the night, the sacred hours of hunting. A shriek here, a roar there, then a deep silence. Mustang, it's a place between Nepal uh, uh, in the high Himalayas. It borders bit to bit. Mustang, a piece of moon rests on the earth baked for centuries. Shadows of yak herds crawl like ants on a blinding canvas of snow, seeking ever receding meadows, the brooks of life. The last yak herder of the day silently follows them into oblivion. Mountains. I wish to lose myself in your immensity. your torrents, your winds. Let your rocks be, let your rocks be my strength. Your cascades my fall, your peaks my rise. And it's a river called Bagmati, which flows in Kathmandu. Flowing words from the mouth of goddess Saraswati. Uh, Ruth mentioned about this goddess in her poem. Flowing words from the mouth of goddess Saraswati. On my banks, civilizations bloom and wither as blue jacaranda. In spring, men, beasts, and gods take a dip into my waters to cleanse their sins. 
Who will cleanse me? Who will make me pristine? And next poem is called Milamchi, which is about a river. Mm. A river flows stealthily into the parched valley, quenching the thirst of the dreamers at night. Disappearing at dawn in tunnels yet to be dug. And now I take you to Latin America from Nepal, Amazon. The anaconda was missing. So they offered us piranha fishing in consolation and bathing with pink dolphins in the Black River. They caught the poor baby caimans at night while they were sleeping and took us across the river to meet the Indians. There were none. Andes. The green breasts of earth rise to quench the thirst of insatiable humanity. Chico Mendes. At first I thought, quote, at first I thought I was fighting to save the rubber trees. Then I thought I was fighting to save the Amazon rainforest. Now I realize I'm fighting for humanity. Chico Mendes. The assassin's bullets killed me. I stopped breathing to give the breath of the world a new lease of life. My dreams became the dreams of humanity to save itself from itself. A thousand Chico Mendeses reincarnated across the planet to face the bullets of a thousand assassins. And this poem is about Iguazu Falls between, uh, which is between Brazil and Argentina. Birds have taken over the sky. A butterfly lands on my hand. Vapor rises high instantly turning into clouds. I'm silent, letting the moment seep in. Equatus comes close with her sad eyes. I walk on the paved trail, dumbfounded, drenched. As nature mourns for our dying planet. I stand in silence, listening to Iguazu Falls, watching a thousand rainbows rise in the sky. I walk to the devil's throat. I'm in the lap of eternity. I try to see her face. It's blinding white. Jaguar. 
wave search shows I'm a car brand. My Rossetti is missing from the internet. My piercing eyes printed on the third page. King penguins, bright orange cheek patch like the sun setting below the horizon. Against surrounding dark feathers like the black of the night. Nearly wiped out by man. The natives of the Tierra del Fugo have returned home. Sao Paulo, giant towers rise in concrete jungles. Birds are absent from the sky. Trees pray for sunlight. And now I take you to the last part, which is from uh, Monsoon. Uh, I wake up with your thoughts, your fragrance reaching me all the way from the Himalayas to the island of Madagascar, brought by monsoon from the blessed Himalayan valley to the hills of Antananarivo on its return journey. I dream of you every night. The shimmering dawn snatches my dreams, but the morning bridge comes whispering your name permeating my being with your thoughts, only your thoughts, my love. I'm far away in this Indian Ocean island, yearning for your touch, gazing at the moon, Venus, and myriad star constellations, hoping you are gazing at them too. I wait for the monsoon to be born, to send you sights, sounds, and aroma of this island, redolent of vanilla, cloves, ylang, ylang and herbs of various kinds. Monsoon web-like mass of air, the primeval traveler from the sea to the land in summer, go to my love in the paradisical Himalayan valley. For eons, you have ferried traders across the Indian Ocean, guided the legendary Sindhubad and Vasco da Gama and brought wealth and joy to millions. Your absence, alas, brings famine and death. The bounty of Indra offered through rains, at times just a spell of scattered stars, at times unceasing torrents for days at a stretch, waiting passion of lovers with your thunder drums. Love sick and far away from my beloved, I beseech you to take my message to her along with the amorous squills of wasa parrots. River reverberating songs of Indri Indri, the sound of sea waves crashing on coral beaches, mating calls of the golden mantelas, mellifluous chirps of red fodi, sonorous songs of the Malagasy kukul, the sight of eye eyes conjoined blissfully at midnight in Maswala rainforests. Fierce fossas meeting boisterously at Kirindi. Colorful turtle, turtles frolicking in the Emerald Sea. 
yellow comet moths swarming Ranomafana, radiated tortoises carrying galactic maps, Somanga sunbirds sipping nectar, white sifakas dancing in a herd, ring-tailed lemurs feasting on baobab flowers, wasa parrots courting their mates, painting butterflies fluttering over fresh blossoms, blooming jacarandas painting the sky purple, travelers' palms stretching their arms in prayer, Baobals meditating like ascetic turned upside down. Giraffe necked red weevils necking their mats. Fragrant champa flowers. Galaxies on the earth. Colorful Mahafali tombs dotting the countryside. Erotic Sakalava sculptures around, arousing longings in mind. Innumerable sculpted rock temples at Isal, each one a homage to Lord Pashupatinath. The rich dialect of the old Gujarati still spoken here with great zeal. Monsoon, I urge you to carry these to my love in the pristine Himalayan Valley. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abhay. That was beautiful. So much tenderness, so many colors, um, so much to reveal about our relationship with nature and how terrible we are, actually. Yeah, very moving meditations, really. And sort of, I think Hedi Habra said, you know, the contrast between all the lush imagery and all the sort of, uh, you know, all the losses of, of you know what's going on in nature as well is really striking mm -hmm. thank you i think we can only i mean i wanted to make a point that we only save something what we love so it's important to to uh, to make to make this connection with nature and then only we will be able to love it and preserve it. Absolutely. Mm. So um, we, I believe we can take the questions in the chat box now. Um, but if anyone would like to use the microphone uh, before we move to the chat box, please feel free to let us know. Just press the hand button and um, we will invite you to ask your question. Do you see any hands, Adam? I don't see any um, here. No, I don't see any. I was just thinking, can, can I start with the question? I, was, I mean, this is very off the cuff. I was just thinking of, of Darwin, actually, Ruth, and I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on this, but there's a sort of, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm just making this up, but I, I feel like there's some parts of perhaps uh, capitalism that is sort of cherry picked from certain elements of Darwinian sort of evolution uh, um, that's kind of disconnected us from the planet and that we can kind of use it in that kind of way. Is that, is, is that, is that true, do you find? Um, <clears throat> I find that difficult to answer because I don't really know very much about sort of the use of Darwin. I mean, Darwinian can mean so many things now and it can, can mean it in lots of different contexts. Um, but Darwin himself was, was trying to explore the mechanisms by, how, by which things work and, and came to be. And he was interested in that. For instance, now I'm sitting just by my garden and um, there are seven green parakeets on the bird feeders. Well, they shouldn't be there. Um, you know, they, I've seen them in India, I, I've seen, I know they come in Africa too, these are rose-ring parakeets, but they've been endemic in you know, um, in Britain now for 30 years, and there are more and more of them. And they're, um, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're crowding out the, the little birds that have, you know, for their nesting places, as well as on the feeders. Darwin would have been very interested because, you know, it is a part of nature. It's some, um, 
they've somehow adapted, although they're used to much hotter time climates. They're, they're um, you know, they've they've gone through snowy winters, and um, he's in, he was interested in how things how things happen and move uh, and develop. But he said, you know, in, in there's, a, there's a great chapter in The Origin of Species, which he wrote after his daughter died, you know, nature is not benign. Um, and there's a ruthlessness in nature. And as you know from David Attenborough, um, you know, I mean, I remember once David Attenborough talking about a, a parasite wasp that lays its eggs inside a caterpillar. And he says, you can see the creature is in agony. That is nature too. Um, and, you know, it's not only us, <laughs> it's the mechanism. Um, and, yeah. yeah, and unfortunately our mechanism is to be extremely greedy. I mean, you know, Gandhi says there's enough in the world for everybody's need, but not for everybody's mm -hmm. greed. Well, that's what that's why I didn't articulate it very well. I think is it that we focus so much on that cruel aspect of nature, and then we forget? For instance, there's these uh, and lots of books have come out. These theories on how trees, for instance, help each other when they're sort of another one is lacking, maybe under attack and that sort of thing, or lacking water. So, yeah, you know, I have so actually seen work on that because I, I was I was doing something on forests, and <clears throat> I think that has been that idea has been. Um, attacked by, oh, is it? by yes by by tree specialists um, oh really okay the, the idea is that that competition still works even in this wonderful we project onto onto trees or all, all our utopian ideas that they're you know, actually nature is benign and generous um that has that idea is i mean it's a lovely idea the mother tree and all that and you know but still the, i mean it's quite clear that they hand on information um, um, yeah, here's a question here. How have we arrived at the notion that nature is other? I know. Um, how did we do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm really, I mean, that was the, that was the discussion we had with Ruth while we were deciding this topic, because, I mean, it was actually fragile nature. Uh, the, the original idea uh, was fragile nature, but I mean, I completely detest this word nature because it sort of, you know, makes humans uh, not part of it. And, uh, and I think this is, we, I mean, as poets, we need to, to find this new uh, word, new language to how do we, so how do we address this, uh, you know, human and nature divide. So I thought that earth could be the, you know, or we thought Earth could be a better way to, to, to collectively express, uh, you know, um, all we have, uh, all our togetherness, you know, humanity and, and nature and every, 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 everything we have. I belong to, a, uh, I'm a trustee of a charity called um, New Networks for Nature, which um, operates in Britain. And um, more and more each year, we're, we're, we're trying to in, engage the younger generation because that, that's where it matters. It's getting the young involved in seeing nature and so on. I mean, there was a, um, one, one year there was, a, there was a girl of about sort of 15 and she um, took inner city kids out and um, they weren't very interested. And then, then she said, you know, that, that peregrine falcon, it can go as fast as a, and then she mentioned some motorbike or other or some airplane. And immediately they were hooked because they knew about motorbikes and, and, and airplanes. And um, if, 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 yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. If, if nature is seen as other and also as elitist by inner city kids that never get a chance to go out, never get a chance to see a butterfly in a, you know, in, in, a, in a meadow, um, or unless they want to catch it, it's, and, and to see what it's doing and why and how it's living in its other life, which is also connected to us. That's, that's, it's the education and the outreach and the connection that is so important. Yeah. That, uh, that's, that's why I wrote the Earth Anthem, you know, uh, because I mean, when we, I mean, I was reading Octavio Paz's uh, Nobel lecture and uh, 
I mean, he says a very pertinent point, you know, when we say world, you know, we mean human world, but uh, insects have their own worlds, dinosaurs, they have their own world. And I mean, uh, so, so we have worlds here, not one world, uh, worlds. And that's why I think earth, something which, which encompasses all these, all these worlds. And uh, I mean, Ruth, you would know there's this, ancient Indian thought, which says, Vasudhava Kutumbakam. And, you know, it's so uncanny that uh, the translation, you know, people translate it as the world is a family, but that's not correct because Vasudha in Sanskrit is not world, it is earth actually. And uh, uh, Vasudhava Kutumbakam means the earth is a family, you know. That's which so means cool. yeah. All the species uh, with whom we inhabit this planet, uh, I mean, it sounds utopian, but but this is this is how it should be. I mean, uh, that you know, then we won't have this nature versus man divide. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's and, and that's why in Earth Anthem I write, uh, you know, uh, all uh, um, that united we stand as species of one Earth, uh, and and it's. It, it's that that interdependence we have to understand. I mean, that's a matter of education for all of us. And I think it will change the way we look at uh, our relationship with nature. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the, I'm not, working on elephants at the moment. It's very hard to tell um, a village kid who, who's the elephants are raiding his father's crops every night. Um, so that we are united on one earth when, when both the elephants and we want to eat. And the elephants are very, very frightening and they can kill you just with a blow. So it's, it's, um, it's the resources, the resources of earth that are, that are so we're wasting, we're wasting so much of. And also, I wonder as well, I mean, you've been writing Ruth, again about, you know, migration and things and, and sort of so dealing with the marginalized in, in many ways and nature, which has been is marginalized, you know, and so it's I suppose it's bringing all, you know, looking at all those aspects, I, I think are interesting as well. It's interesting that Abe said as well about loving the earth. And yet, you know, we have this thing of this problem of really loving ourselves, perhaps, you know, and us being nature. So all of that perhaps being connected. Yeah, I mean, when I when I was working on the Tiger Book, and even now <clears throat> with more with with working on elephants, um, you know, they, several people said to me, the conservationists said to me very sadly, well, wild animals don't have votes, and um, you know why <clears throat> it's cheaper to to um, get rid of the laws and and to cut down some forest that belongs to the, the animals than it is to buy somebody's forest. Um, from a human being. And so more and more the, the wild places get depleted. And yeah, I think there are some questions uh, from. Yes, uh, Chun, yes. Chun, Chun Yu, who is also a scientist and a poet. Um, Chun, it must be pretty late. Chun is joining us from China today. Yes, and hi. She a wonderful poem. Uh, last Thank week, uh, a poem about plastic, making it into <laughs> our bloodstream and lots of fascinating facts into poetry. So uh, Chun, please go ahead. Yes, well, thank you. Thanks to the two wonderful poets uh, for your amazing poems. I'm, I'm really blown away. I'm so glad. I, I am staying up <laughs> after midnight. Uh, and uh, so I, I want to um, bring up uh, the concept of Taoism. Um, you know, I wonder how many you, you have uh, of you had read the book, uh, the Tao Te Ching or the uh, Book of the Way by one of the greatest philosophers um, in Chinese history, I think in world history. And uh, in Taoism, uh, humans are not um, in any way put <laughs> above nature. We are just part of the universe and the great doubt, we have to follow the way of the universe and, and uh, otherwise we are in trouble. And uh, the universe, um, it doesn't 
romanticize anything and all existence have to coexist and there is a way to follow and uh, I feel um, as both of the poets um, also expressed um, we disrespect I feel we all disrespected the way things have to work and um, and, and but it's a, a wisdom from 2500 years ago and uh, it offers if you have a chance to read it I really suggest it and it's on YouTube there are many versions on YouTube you can listen to it's less than an hour and a half the whole book but the wisdom it contains it contains it's just amazing and yeah I just want to bring that up and maybe some of you have read it and have something some comments on that Thank you. Oh, Shannon. I also want to. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> one there more thing go. I want to. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, yeah. One more thing I want to mention is um, because I, I come back to China because my mom, um, she's she's sick. She's she's not doing well at all. She has a caretaker um, who is this wonderful woman from the country, countryside. She talks about nature. <laughs> not she doesn't romanticize anything she says when she was a young child when humans are weak there's when there's a natural disaster all humans are making their own trouble man-made troubles i won't mention you know i won't go to the big details of chinese history but the animals actually sense that when humans are becoming weak the packs of wolves will come to the village they will snatch animals and as, as well as human beings. And if she had lost a brother, older brother to a wolf and, and the brother was hanging to the mother and she, he was hungry, he was crying, he was very little. And all of a sudden he was, the mother didn't hear anything, he was snatched away. And, and it's like, you know, I, listen to that story she tells it to me with no drama in it she's she's just part she said i was just part of life and it is really astonishing when i hear and people also honestly talk about it um so anyways that's one of the stories i i was just hearing from her about a couple of weeks ago I, i'm like oh my gosh i i had no idea yeah we, we really need to listen who Two people who are really close to nature. Um, I mean, I I grew up in the countryside, but there was no wolf around where I lived. Thanks, John Yu. I'm not sure if um if there's any comments you had on that, but I think Miriam also has a, a question. If uh... Well, not a question, but ah. um, just a little comment. I just to. To, to tell you that I agree with Chu and with um, uh, Abe. Uh, so I'm still um, in, intrigued by the, the power of uh, maybe a wrong theory, but it's a theory. Uh, I mean, the endurance of uh, Ernest uh, Hackel idea that our bodies uh, are um, compelled to uh, remember the sea, no? uh, or in, um, in the words of the uh, feminist philosophers uh, such as uh, Helen, Helen Chixus and uh, Catherine Clemen, um, it we, we, we should all we should it would be um, nice to remember that the, um, um, to remember the French homonyms, no mare and mare, no. So we uh, ourselves are. Um, uh, sea, sands, corals, uh, and so on. So, and um, a, another comment um, regards um, uh, Ruth's uh, uh, beautiful poems. Um, so, uh, Ruth, uh, you 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 find a way uh, to. 
uh, tell us that um, we should not forget our uh, belonging to um, the element of uh, water, no? Uh, so um, it is when we um, uh, see the mother elephant you know, carrying her calf in, um, in grief for, for uh, days that we uh, believe in the reality of uh, maternal love. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yes. I mean, one of the things that I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in in working on elephants is people say they love elephants and I ask them why, why do they love elephants? And they nearly always reply about emotion that elephants um, mourn their dead or elephants um, live in families or um, they, they, they like the emotion of it, the playfulness and the emotion. And I think that actually elephants are very, very empathic, like us. I mean, like us, they they evolved in the African plains and um, they evolved to live in large groups or fairly large groups and family groups, and they they care about each other. And um, we have, you know, and yet our history of what we've done to the elephant is is so completely appalling. And yet elephants forgive us. I mean, they, they sometimes, I mean, they, you know, they make very close bonds, even with people who are very unpleasant to them. So um, there's a very complex relationship with nature there that we can somehow, it would be useful to understand and build on. Oh. You, you can't imagine um, our animality as separate from our elementality. No, no. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Congratulations to the two poets of today. I think, uh, you know, uh, Ruth, you're making a point uh, which is very pertinent and we must understand that humanity, you know, is not going to save nature because humanity, you know, is uh, in, you know has great empathy for nature actually we would uh, save nature because we are ourselves we realize that if we don't save nature we will be ourselves uh, we will ourselves become extinct so i think this realization is 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 behind you know this new movement to i mean save nature but i mean uh, majority of us uh, we tend to, you know, um, I think um, to overemphasize on our, uh, you know, humane part, you know, which is kindness and good nature and all that. But I mean, at the base of it, you know, we are basically uh, the most cruel animal on this planet. So, uh, uh, so that we have to, I mean, understand that we will all, nature will only be saved because we realize that it is in our own enlightened, self-enlightened interest to save it. Yeah. yeah. But as we speak, um, there's a UN, at the UN they are arguing about the climate, some climate bill, and people are objecting to the scientists' words and saying, you know, we must end coal, um, for example. But, you know, it, people are not going to end coal. And the, you know, the, the legislators from every country are going to wriggle out of it if they possibly can. Mm -hmm. I mean, picking yeah. back up on uh, what Adam Adam's question in the beginning on Darwinism, um, if we think of survival of the fittest, are we really the fittest? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I just, don't um, think so. No. <laughs> we, destroy, <laughs> we destroy everything, but it doesn't, I mean, it's kind of weakening us. It's not really, it's not really making us the fittest or the strongest. And through poetry, I mean, this is what we see. We see how man, as Abhay said, needs to protect himself from himself. So we're kind of um, inflicting our own self-destruction on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I want to quote Vislava here. You know, she said that in the beginning, I mean, it's quote. In the beginning, I thought that it's uh, it's possible to save humanity, but then I realized that, you know, it's not. 
so uh, uh, so I think you know I mean we have a problem um, as a species mm -hmm. and uh, um, and this I mean uh, this realization I mean look at uh, you know look around us what's happening we realize that we are in a crisis yet <clears throat> look what we are doing. I mean, there's a complete gap between uh, the reality and our response to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, that, that was really what, you know, that's when I went back to Mrs. Noah, I mean, there's a famous, there's a children's opera called Benjamin Britten in which, you know, God has spoken to Noah, he gets the thing right, but Mrs. Noah um, doesn't believe a word of it and she wants to stay drinking with her friends. She has to be dragged onto the ark. <coughs> Okay, um, I can see a few questions in the chat box. Um, Hamad Al Hamadi, uh, a question for Abhay. Has a poem ever humbled or frightened you, and what was it? <laughs> There's so many. I mean, uh, you know, I have, I mean, I find that uh, the unparalleled style of T.S. Eliot, I mean, I'm, I'm like, I have no words actually. Uh, I find him just too good, uh, and I have rewritten. I mean, the best way, the best way to admire someone is to copy someone, right? So, <laughs> so I have tried to rewrite many of his poems, and uh, uh, one poem is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, one of them is called Diplomacy, which is a rewriting of the Angry Man, and uh, also. Uh, Carnival, you know, which is uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Uh, but uh, uh, but back home, you know, so many, I mean, I, I remember uh, writing a poem of Rabindranath Tagore uh, called the where, the where the Mind is Without Fear uh, from Gitanjali uh, in my essay uh, for the exam, you know, to exam to, to become a diplomat. <laughs> And uh, I wrote that poem in the essay, and I think I got lots of marks because I wrote that poem. <laughs> and uh, and so many, I mean, Kalidas, for example, Kalidas is one of the greatest poets. I read Meghdoot, I mean, which is the cloud messenger. And uh, um, Ruth was mentioning about, uh, you know, Himalayas and all. So he, he writes about this, uh, uh, you know, mythical being who is exiled from the Himalayas to the central India. And then he sends his message through the cloud. And I wanted to bring his uh, Meghdut uh, uh, as an example of eco poem, because that there in this poem, everything animate or inanimate, it all becomes, uh, they are all personified. So the cloud is personified, the river is personified and trees are personified. So, so then you don't, mountains are personified. So you don't have this distinction in this thought, you know, uh, where you have something animate and you have inanimate and you can only like, uh, uh, so everything, I mean, it, it takes us also back to, to this whole discussion we had on divide between the nature and man and also this divide between animate and inanimate. So. So Kalidas, he brings everything together, you know, even the cloud is a personific, I mean, person, I mean, he addresses the cloud and asks the cloud to take a message to his beloved. So, uh, so this, I mean, I find this philosophy very interesting because until we see everything as one, you know, uh, even, I mean, even a mountain, for example, I just read a poem about the mountain and Ruth read, uh, read her poem about Shiva's eye and Saraswati and water. And so, so, I mean, we should not treat water and mountains as kind of non-living, you know, things. But, uh, but, but, but living beings, you know, they also have that. For example, some countries now they have given rights, for example, New Zealand or to rivers that, you know, they have their own personification and uh, any, I mean, any pollution of the river is a crime against that river and they have legal rights. And so has, you know, other, some other countries done it. So I think this is, this is the, this is what the direction, this is the direction we have to move uh, in the right time. 
So these are my, I mean, I was telling about uh, my favorite poets, so Kalidas and, uh, and I have this whole monsoon actually, you know, uh, I read a poem uh, and uh, called Lockdown by Simon Amites uh, in 2000, I mean, 2020. Mm, and uh, he mentioned in his poem about this Megdut of Kalidas. And, you know, the one poem inspired me to translate the whole book into, from Sanskrit into English, and then inspired me to write a whole new poem called Monsoon, you know, which has just come out. So, so, I mean, these are, I mean, I mean, they have not only um, sort of uh, uh, inspired me, but I mean, inspired me to go to the extent to rewrite them or, you know, to add to what they have done. Mm. It's interesting what you say about the, the personification element and, and uh, it, it seems as well, I wonder, is there, is there a connection that we've lost this connection, realizing that other parts of nature are actually living and you know as we are and I wonder if that's the same with symbols as well and how that feeds into the images in poetry and art and that is there some connection there I wonder do you see anything like that Ruth and I think the wish to symbolize is is what we live by we 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 see ourselves and things we want to see in patterns of the world and you know like the like the stars, we see our myths and stories in the stars. And um, um, yeah, symbolism is in inescapable. I remember when I was when I was first walking actually in Nepal, where I mean, was for so long, um, in a tiger forest, a man who'd studied tigers a long time. And I was, I was trying to, I was saying, the trouble is that people see the tiger as a symbol and so they want to, you know, so they want a bit of slice of that power and that beauty and hence, you know, the tiger penis and the tiger bones and the ti all the rest of it, or the tiger rugs. And um, he said, yes, symbolism is very useful to work with, but it can be a very hard master. <laughs> um, and that's the trouble that symbolism is, is good and bad. I mean, um, symbolism is, isn't, isn't good or bad in itself, but we have an innate um, tendency to symbolize and see the world in terms of symbols that matter to us. And that isn't always good for the world. It's not good for tigers. <laughs> yeah. Right. Even though we love them and find them beautiful and everything. Yeah. I wanted to add to what Ruth said that, you know, see what we have done that we have separated ourselves from, uh, from from trees, from animals, you know, we have put the animals in the zoo, where the, where on the weekends children can go and visit them, and we have put trees in the reserve parks and forests uh, away from the cities. Uh, so an average child, for example, does not know which tree if there is a tree outside um, in the street, which tree is that, or which bird, uh, you know, comes uh, singing. So we have deliberately, you know, as part of our urban urbanization process, we have moved away from nature, you know? I mean, I, have, I don't have another word to use. So, uh, uh, so, I mean, I would love to have another word. I mean, maybe flora and fauna. So, uh, so this, uh, uh, this separation, uh, we, have to, we have to work on this, uh, this separation which we have created it's basically segregation if you look in terms of you know the political um, i mean uh, history it's basically segregation you know we are we are segregating ourselves from nature we are segregating nature from ourselves and we we we, we have also this philosophy that you know uh, god created all these animals and plants for human beings you know and uh, that is another problem. <laughs> so uh, these, this, this, we have to move away from that. They were not created for us. And slowly we are realizing that we are interdependent. You know, it's uh, ducks and uh, uh, also, I mean, I mean, the, the problem of, uh, mm, you know, mass, uh, I mean, uh, these animals which are, which become food for us, you know, the mass rearing of these animals away from their natural surroundings. So, 
I mean, at the heart of uh, heart of our problem is this this divide, this segregation. And I think, as poets and writers, as thinkers, our responsibility today is to find new vocabulary. For example, I can't use the word nature, but I don't have another word. And uh, I want to, I would love to do that uh, so that we, we talk in an integrated way. We don't talk about, we, we don't have to talk about this linguistic divide uh, where nature becomes uh, a separate uh, entity and we humans look at it as nature. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think Glenda has a comment or a, or a question. Glenda, would you like to unmute? Uh, um, I had a question, but now I have a comment because some <laughs> of my questions have been answered already. Um, my comment is that we've only recently understood that there have been a number of different species on Earth of humans. There have been Neanderthals, Denisovians, and who knows, at least half a dozen. All of them are extinct except us. That should be the writing on the wall, and it's been there for a long time. But speaking of a long time, I think it's very important. People keep talking about humans in terms of how we evolved as if evolution was finished. Evolution is not finished, and it's still going on with us and every other creature and thing on the planet that we haven't made extinct. So it seems to me that human beings, we're still, we've been here such a short time on the planet, during which we've done such a massive amount of damage overall. But um, we're like a baby who's lying on its back and doesn't really realize that its toes are its toes. <laughs> what's happening now is that we're starting to recognize, hey, um, that's part of me and I'm part of it. So I think that we've put ourselves aside as people have said, like, as if we were the only creatures that had consciousness. And we've constantly been, our scientists have been trying to find ways that we're different from other beings. Like we use tools, we have feelings, all this is crap. Everything is conscious. I think the entire, if we're conscious, how could we be conscious on a planet that's not conscious? And if the planet's conscious, how could the planet be conscious in a universe that's not conscious? And we've been reflecting back to the source through our various differentiated ways, differential experience. But now we need, and I think we are, we are starting to evolve toward a consciousness of our oneness with everything. But can we evolve fast enough to stop total destruction? Because if we don't survive as humans, if we don't continue evolving as humans, there'll be nothing here to remember that we were here at all. <laughs> That's just a comment. I'll, I'll stop there. I can see a lot more stuff up there. And it seems like COVID and, and what's in going on in Ukraine at the moment is pushing us to evolve as well with regards to energy, regards to how we're online a lot more than just jumping on a plane for a one hour meeting in Hong Kong or somewhere, you know. Anyway, I shouldn't comment. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, commenting, I mean, if, if Ruth wants to say something, otherwise I would like to come in. You, you go in, you go in. Yeah. Okay. So, so Glenda, I mean, I'm glad you, you made that comment, you know, I read about my first poem, which I read about was evolution, you know, that how evolution kind of, you know, how man is, uh, uh, I mean, most likely to join the dodos and dinosaurs soon, if we, if we don't realize uh, what we are doing. And uh, um, we have been, in fact, as you said, very short time on this planet, I mean, in geological uh, times at geological time scale so um, so that's 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 a high possibility that we might i mean we might become extinct um, if we don't act now uh, the second thing is you know which also answers partly chun's uh, question or comment uh, and here's a poem, you know, to answer your, this consciousness, you know, universe, I mean, if you pay attention is actually, it's a Latin word, which means one verse. Um, I mean, and poetry is, the, is at the heart of universe. And, uh, uh, and, and here's a poem, it's my very first poem, it's called Soul Song. And, uh, uh, and it is, I was always here as blowing wind or falling leaves, as at shining sun or flowing streams, at chirping birds or blooming buds, as the blue sky or the empty space. 
I was never born. I didn't die. Thank you. Well, I have to go now, um, but that's what was beautiful, Ante. Thank you. Thank you, beautiful. everybody. Mm. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, I'm so sorry for anyone who had questions or comments that we couldn't take, but um, it's very exciting and um, it's been very interactive. Uh, and I'm sure Ruth and Abhe uh, would not mind you connecting with them on social media, and then maybe you could ask them your questions there uh, or through email. Um, thank you so much, Ruth, and thank you, Abhe. This has been wonderful. And um, we are truly honored to, to have you both with us today and to not only hear your poems, but your thoughts and your reflections on the whole eco-poetics themes. Uh, and thank you, Adam. Thank you for being a wonderful co-host and uh, taking care of everything and everyone. And uh, Chun Yu, I think you should go to sleep pretty soon. <laughs> it's almost 1 a.m. in China right now. <clears throat> so, <laughs> and, uh, thank you. We hope to see you. To see you. Awake <laughs> and try to save ourselves with all of our wonderful posts here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you. Right. So thank we you. hope to see you all again soon. Abhe, Ruth, thank you. Um, tomorrow's event has been canceled uh, because Antonia couldn't make it. Um, something urgent popped up. But uh, we will be back on uh, Wednesday with Romalyn Anti. And uh, Thursday, we have Anthony Anaxagoru. And Friday, we have a session on poetry and the diaspora. Uh, where many poets will be reading. We have Andre Nafisahili, we have Anthony Anaxagoru, Antonia Taylor, uh, Kostya Tsoulakis, uh, Omar Sabbar, and me. So uh, we hope to see you for as many uh, sessions that you can make. And um, for now, it's a goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Rula. Thanks so much. I want, to, Bye, thank you so much. I want to thank you, Adam and Rula Maria. Thank you for this. Thanks so much. What a great reading. Thank you. Thank your you. leadership to, to bring, bring us together. And thank you, each one of you. Namaste. 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 <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>